Thank you very much. Um, uh, particular thanks uh, to our audience. It's remarkable to see so many of you when I know there's another uh, rather distracting event in the less global city of Washington. Um, but uh, just uh, in case you're tempted to um, spend your entire morning on Twitter, um, do, uh, do uh, concentrate on our excellent panelists. Instead, uh, you can catch up with all the action on FT.com through that three-month uh, free trial that Gillian Tett plugged last night. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's the end of my ad. Um, uh, delighted to be here for the third year running as part of the FT partnership with uh, Chicago Forum on Global Cities. Uh, and I think this is a particularly timely panel. Um, we've got a terrific um, array of experts to bring us um, quite different perspectives on all the different angles here. Um, just before I introduce them, a reminder, we'd love to have your questions. Um, I'll be putting your questions uh, to the panel at the end. Uh, please submit them in the form of, of a tweet. We will be paying attention to them on the monitors and uh, the little iPad I have here. Um, so just uh, the usual hashtag, Global Cities 2017, you know the drill. Um, so without uh, further delay, can I introduce my, my panelists? Um, very pleased to be joined by Sir Bernard Ho Hogan Howe, um, who until the end of March was Commissioner of the uh, Metropolitan Police in London. Um, his other claim to fame is that he once uh, ran out of, interrupted an interview to go and apprehend a suspect. So I'm hoping that uh, he makes it all the way through the panel uh, without uh, distractions. But I'm counting on all of you to be sufficiently law-abiding. I'll try and be that too. Um, Megan Clifford uh, is the Director of Strategy and Innovation at the Global Security Science Division of the Argonne National Laboratory here in Chicago. Uh, before that, she worked with the Department of Homeland Security uh, to prepare the National Preparedness uh, doctrine. Um, uh, also bringing uh, great expertise uh, to the panel here, uh, Martin Kimani, uh, the director of the National Counterterrorism Center in Kenya, um, a former uh, a permanent representative to the UN in uh, Nairobi. Um, to his left, David Paulison, uh, Paulison apologies, mm -hmm. uh, former for director of FEMA um, and current uh, member of the Board of Trustees of UL. Uh, he's also a, a former fire chief of uh, Miami-Dade County and I think a 30-year career in firefighting. So Miami-Dade County. So, I got that completely wrong, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, Thomas Teig, uh, the CEO of Direct Relief, who's working in, which is working in 50 states, 70 countries on uh, humanitarian assistance, um, uh, both before and after. Uh, some of the disasters and uh, disruptions we're going to be talking about. Um, a former um, executive at the Peace Corps as well. So uh, I've established your credentials. Um, <laughs> and we have a lot to cover, um, both about man-made disruptions uh, and about natural um, disasters. Um, I think we all have heard uh, in the previous, in this morning's panel, in the um, plenary last night, um, that we are expecting uh, extreme weather disruptions and um, uh, terrorism disruptions to increase in global cities. Um, so what can we do to prepare for them? What can we do to make our global cities more resilient? Uh, what can we learn from each other as global cities um, as we look to, uh, to respond? But I'd like to start uh, with Bernard, if I may. Um, the London attacks are fresh in the mind. Um, uh, one of the extraordinary um, facts uh, about the London Bridge attacks is that the Metropolitan uh, Police, um, which Bernard led until just a few months ago, um, had not just responded but neutralised the threat within eight minutes of the first call coming in to the emergency services. Um, what did you do by way of preparedness um, to enable a response like that to a crisis like the terrorist attack that we saw this weekend? Well, I suppose the, the calculus changed for us, as I suppose it did around the world, when in Syria and Iraq we saw that um, so many things were happening with what became known as Daesh and the mass migration that followed that. Um, and then we saw the attacks throughout Western Europe. And uh, we were fortunate for a long time in the UK for that not to happen, with one single exception. About four years ago, a trooper called Lee Rigby was murdered on the streets of London, and that was a horrible event. But with that one exception, we'd managed to uh, keep control and of course, the big uh, protection for everyone uh, is good intelligence. So provided you know who will attack you, you take them out before they hurt you. Once they start trying to hurt you, you, you really are on the back foot. So we've always followed that mantra. 
which has been to arrest, put through the courts, and then where necessary, people, people go to prison. And so for the last few years, we have arrested probably a person a day throughout the United Kingdom, uh, two thirds of which have been convicted and then gone to prison. And that stopped a lot of what we've seen. But clearly over the last few weeks, that has changed. So on top of the context we saw in the Middle East, and the impact it had, because it wasn't just what was happening in the Middle East, we saw 12,000 people from Europe go to Syria mainly uh, to fight. And uh, from the UK, it's approaching 1,000 people, France, I think 2,000. And of course, the concern was if they went there, what happened when they came back? Apart from the fact that they got links back to each of our countries anyway, we had to make sure that we, uh, we kept that under control. So that was a big piece of work, together with the security services uh, we undertook. The second thing which is directly pertinent to the attack in Borough Market, uh, now only a few days ago, was that when we saw the attacks in, uh, in France, in Paris in particular, we knew that we had to change the way that we prepared. We have never been an armed police force. Mm. The UK, we, that's just not what we do. We have some officers with guns who patrol the streets, but relatively few. In the Met, we had 32,000 cops, uh, of which 2,100 have firearms. Um, so clearly, not everyone. But our way has always been to give good weapons, good training to relatively few people and then ask them to deal with it rather than give everybody a handgun. What we saw in Paris, and you remember the Charlie Hebdo attack? Yes. So when some cartoonists were murdered, um, two attackers, the first policeman who turned up was shot dead because he was outgunned. So everyone having a gun is not of itself a protection to this type of thing. Um, so we sort of looked at that, and the second thing was we realized we would be challenged by the fact that when they went to ground, as they did in France, big rural country, difficult to search big open spaces if you don't have enough firearms. So we came to a regiment with the military, that's something called Operation Tempera, which was put in place over the last uh, few days. But that took about a month, you can imagine about a year to get in place. Right. You can't just ask the military to re reorientate in such a quick way. So that preparation was made as from that, that attack because that was one of my concerns was talking to the government. How did we get that resourcing there? The second one was the second attack as we saw which ended in the Backland Theatre when 130 people were murdered and hundreds of people were badly injured. Um, our concern was that there were, set, I think there were seven attack sites, four different groups. How would we have coped with our relatively small resources when you had to split them over different sites? And of course, after the first attack, you don't know the other three are coming, or the four, the seven. Um, so you're really in danger of limited resources getting sucked in. So the big preparatory thing that we put in place, which I think really helped in the Borough Market situation, was to increase significantly the number of police officers armed, right. which was only another 700, proportionately very big, but numerically relatively small. But it meant that we had them in significant numbers of vehicles. So I think three or four vehicles turned up, three officers in each. And we saw they weren't armed, but they were killing people. Right. And uh, you had to confront them quickly, because if you fail on the intelligence side for some reason, you have to neutralize, deal with uh, very quickly. So I think that was the, one of the major things. I think there are other things we may come on to about design of place. Um, but I think, because um, of course, if you're not careful, you always react to the last event. Yeah. Let's, come, let's, let's come back to some of those things, because I think that's, a, that's, 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 a, that's very true, and that's an important point. Um, uh, Megan, give us some perspective on the, um, the angle you come at these problems from in the Argonne National Lab. Yes, thank you, Andrew. So Argonne National Lab, for those of you that might not be familiar with us, we are a Department of Energy laboratory. We're part of a laboratory network here in the United States. We are managed by University of Chicago, and really what I see the laboratories and the university system here in the United States and beyond, we have a responsibility to bring the best science and data available to address these challenges. I like the tweet that was up on the board earlier from the last panel that said, in God we trust, everybody else bring data. Um, and so we really um, feel strongly about that and the, real, the mission and purpose of Argonne National Laboratory is to advance the science and engineering to address some of the national problems here in the U.S., but also those problems are uh, very common across the world. Great. And um, Martin, you, you bring the perspective of a, of a city with very different economics, with very different population channel, challenges, very different, uh, a different form of terrorist threat. Um, how does this problem look to you from the Kenyan perspective? Oh, well, thank you, Andrew. It's great to be in Chicago. Uh, my, um, 
lack of resilience showed this morning when I got hopelessly lost uh, <laughs> on, on, on the way here, uh, but I managed to survive. Um, look, um, the description of the outstanding response by the London Metropolitan Police I think illustrates both the challenge uh, of what cities have to contend with when it comes to security. Um, you can't, eight minutes from alert to response is, is phenomenal. And you could reduce that to six minutes, you could reduce it to four minutes, but ultimately, uh, the aggressive investments we're making in counterterrorism, as critical as they are, are insufficient to deal, I think, with a problem that cities have to deal with. And that problem is, number one, uh, having an idea and an ideology that is deeply illiberal, uh, that is extremely violent and opposed to cosmopolitan values. Um, and that idea, of course, is militant jihadism. It's not the first such idea. Uh, but certainly, I think it's a great threat to the cohesion and progress of cities. I, and so my first point, and almost my sole point of the morning, is to challenge cities, because cities are, by definition, the headquarters of bourgeoisie values, liberal values, open values, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of re religion. Uh, but we are yet to see this amazing fount of ideas and knowledge uh, take its place on the front lines against this truly terrible ideology. Number two is that the future of cities looks less like London and more like Nairobi. Uh, we have the fastest growing cities in the world as Africa and other parts of the global south. That population growth is very different qualitatively and quantitatively from what happened in cities like Chicago, because the majority of people moving into the city, cities are jobless, and there's no attendant manufacturing process and industrialization that is managing to create the living. And so you have simultaneously the breaking of social bonds from the rural areas, uh, at the same time with joblessness and these political entrepreneurs who drive ideas such as militant jihadism. Um, lastly, I think um, one of the things that strikes me from my former diplomatic life is that the cities talking most about cities are wealthy cities, but the future is really in poor cities, uh, both good and bad. So it's very important for cities such as Chicago, New York, London, to understand that the conversation needs to be a global cities conversation. Otherwise, what's going to happen is the progressive walling off of prosperity, and at its door will be the results of uh, complications in cities such as mine. I think that raised some great questions about economic and social resilience that we should explore in a bit more depth uh, when we come back. Um, David, um, what's your experience been uh, through, through the, your firefighting career, through FEMA, now at UL, about um, not just responding to these disruptions, but, but preparing for them? I think the, um, thank you, it's a good question. The, what I see cities failing to do is to do their no kidding assessment of what their issues are, uh, particularly when it comes to what, what could happen in your city. If you look, if you take a city and look at the last, let's say, 50 years, and what has happened in the last 50 years, uh, that you have to prepare for. Uh, South Florida, or you know, in Miami and Fort Lauderdale area that I live in, we know we're gonna have hurricanes, that's a given. So we need to prepare for that, we need to prepare for flooding. If you live in LA or San Francisco, you're gonna be preparing for earthquakes. So doing that assessment, and, and then looking very clearly at your city itself. You know, look at your building codes. Are they w able to withstand the type of disaster you know you're going to have? And oftentimes it's not. And what we see is a repetitive of, of building being knocked down or destroyed, and we build them back exactly the same way. It's uh, you know some groundhog day all over again. Uh, but it goes further than that. It goes to the point of looking very clearly at your preparedness plan. Are your plans able to uh, uh, deal with what you think you're going to be having based on your past history? Uh, looking at your staff. 
uh, but you need to make sure you have the right people around you and, do, and doing a no kidding assessment of yourself if you're the mayor or the emergency manager or the person that's in charge. You know, do I have the capability of dealing with this? And then putting your plans together, uh, doing exercises. And it, I, I see way too many times when people do their exercises, you know, they're very religious about doing them every year, uh, but they're so scripted that at the end of the day, they haven't done anything that shows where the weaknesses are. And if you right. don't push your plan, push your exercise to the very limit until it breaks, you'll never know what your weaknesses are, and that's what you have to do. And once you figure out what that weakness is, then you can prepare and fix that, and then do another one the next year, and so on and so on. So that, I think that's what cities have to do to make sure they're prepared and ready to go for whatever's gonna come their way. Right. Mm -hmm. So Thomas, an organization like Direct Relief, we think of a lot of your work as being reactive, responsive to a crisis. How much of your time are you spending on that preparedness side? Uh, thank you. It's, you know, it's an increasing amount just because the, uh, the level and um, size of emergencies, or the frequency and size are getting bigger. But I think in general, you know, we're looking at this situation through the lens of human health and the risks that come in emergencies. And a lot of it is predictable, as David said. I mean, we, um, if you understand vulner who's vulnerable, who's vulnerable in emergencies, the, the, um, the answer is that the people who are most vulnerable, the people who are most vulnerable the day before. And that's known. So if you can understand basically the confluence of the built environment, the natural environment, and demographics, that's kind of, it lends itself, you know, a, a highly concentrated population in substandard housing in a flood prone area is a potential disaster. A big seismic, um, seismically active area that's unpopulated is just an, uh, unpopulated, it's just a natural event. So I think we try hard to look at who is vulnerable from where and from uh, where and from what. And I think at Direct Relief, as some of the other speakers this morning were talking about, to mobilize private resources and businesses who are part of it. They, you know, I think the private sector and the public sector, they look out different windows, but they're on the same boat. You know, and so I think there's no question they both need each other to affect any positive reduction of vulnerability or response to an emergency. And I think we try to do that all the time, including with some of your great sponsors here like AbbVie who get it. I mean, the healthcare companies in particular are often called upon because of the, the risks to human health that come, whether it's Ebola or the, uh, the historic floods in Ecuador. I know there's a, a mayor from Barra here Today, these are things that Direct Relief responded to through that lens. Who, what's the structure in that community that's gonna be there five years from now? That's who you should plug into and take your cues from. Okay, so. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Um, because he brought up a good point about who, we, who should government be taking care of? Uh, and what we saw in Hurricane Wilma in South Florida, where we should know better, tens of thousands of people lined up for food and water. I mean, literally hours after the winds died down. Now, there are people who are physically, physically or mentally unable to take care of themselves. Those are the ones that government needs to focus on. For the rest of us, for the rest of us, uh, we should be taking care of, make sure we prepare ourselves to take care of ourselves for three or four days, which we know is gonna take a while for that supply chain to get going. And we don't see that happening. Uh, and that puts a huge strain on not only our, our, our public and private sector, but also on the government itself, you simply do not have the resources to feed an entire population of a, of a large city. So wh why is that not happening? Is it because cities are not assessing the threat um, honestly and uh, you know, looking, at, looking at the weaknesses um, that you mentioned um, uh, so clear-sightedly, or is it that they're not then communicating uh, potential threats to their populations? I think it's a combination of both of those. I, think after, I know after a hurricane or after an earthquake, we see people starting to prepare themselves, but the further and further you, you get away from that event, people start forgetting, start getting lax. Well, it hasn't happened in five years, so I'm not, I'm not gonna worry about it this year. And, uh, and so it's that, uh, it's that lackness, but it's also uh, not communicating to the public, telling them what's expected of them and what you would want them to do if something happens. And, uh, and oftentimes we don't see that happening, particularly in our larger cities. And so, if, I, if I could also add to that, I, I think oftentimes we're thinking about this at a local level. And what's happening is these events are actually at a regional, national, and if you think about cybersecurity, at a global level. And so the cascades, what people might be preparing for within a particular city, there's infrastructure that's connected to other assets. 
So if a substation goes down in a particular area, that could have a large cascading impact over a region much greater than just within those city boundaries. Um, and then also on the health side, you know, I think going back to your point of, you know, the, the folks that are not healthy or need the support in advance, we can do the systems level modeling. Right. We can see how to get, um, and there's a picture that might come up behind me, <laughs> um, of a couple of our scientists that have done this and looked at the spread of Ebola. Um, or flu and how um, we can actually put strategies and interventions in place so that the diseases don't spread or we can isolate things and actually uh, not have uh, such a severe uh, resulting impact and cascade. I'm now quite alarmed by this uh, slide. What, uh, <laughs> tell, tell me that uh, Ebola is not stalking. Chicago, alarmed right? is, is one way to describe it. I feel great about it because I know there's very, very smart people, um, not only at Argonne National Laboratory, but you know, across the world that are working on problems like this. And this is actually a model of um, the Chicago area, and it's a simulation, and it's using our supercomputer um, over at Argonne, and that allows us to run multiple simulations to see how diseases would spread within a city. So let, let's, let's um, focus in on this question of assessing the threat, um, and particularly assessing how the threat may be changing. Um, can you give us a sense of how, how that has worked in London? Um, and then I, I, I want to bring Martin in on as well about how, how you do this, how you work uh, to just um, get a sense of priority risks for a, a city as complex uh, as, as a London or a Nairobi that could be hit by you know, extreme weather, cyber attacks, terrorist attacks, or whatever. I think, I think there are two things in terms of the threat. So one is, What's the generic threat? So we have a system, and I think most countries will have similar, which is that there is an objective assessment made by, in our case, the security service. So they are separate from the politicians. It's not a political decision whether the threat level rises or falls, because there can be many. I mean, we've just been explaining. In the UK, for people here, we're having a general election today. They won't impact, I guess, in America today. But they've just had to look at the threat assessment in the last 14 days. That's quite a political decision, as well as it is an objective one. So one of the ways is to isolate that assessment to a security service who should not be affected by political judgments. And Which lends them. credibility to it. Because Probably so, I mean, because we, for example, we the police rely on it, the public need to rely on it. Yep. So they have to believe it's an objective assessment. So I think one, obviously you've got good, able people who are gonna make uh, that assessment. The second thing, you've got to assess the threat from the people. If it's a people thing, not a natural disaster, what about these people who are trying to hurt you? So you've seen in the press in the UK over the last few days, it is said there are around 23,000 people who in their mind have got an inclination to get involved in terrorism, of which three to 4,000 are moving from it's a nice idea to actually thinking about doing it. That is a huge number of people. Hmm. So how do you mitigate the threat when you can't lock them all up, nor should you, you can't control their behavior entirely, and until you can put them through a court and convict them, neither can you detain them uh, in a prison. So you have to find some way of, <clears throat> of moderating that. So we prioritize those people as well as the threat, and they're put into four priority orders, usual triangle of right. A serious threat. And you're refreshing that on a regular basis, are you? Yep, because there's new names coming up. Occasionally names will drop off, uh, they get arrested, they will die, they will, you know, so that, that yeah. list will, will change. But it's not a precise science. We try and objectify something which relies on an element of human judgment, and we're all flawed in that. Um, which is why sometimes these judgments go wrong, or the people's behavior changes before our objective se assessment says it will. We think it'll take them six months, and 48 hours later, they had a bad day. Right. and then we all have a bad day. But you try your best to objectify those, but it seems to me that as a result of that calculus is that what you have to consider is how you embed resilience in what you do, because you will get those assessments wrong. Mm. It'll be days when the people defeat, you know, the, your attackers, your enemy defeats your ability to predict their behavior. So you've got to embed some resilience. And it seems to me that, you know, design is a massive opportunity. How do you design? We've heard this morning about people designing buildings to cope with earthquakes. It can be done. We probably thought that could never be done. But you can design things to cope. Um, you can design the way that your people respond better. You, know, you can put better processes in place. You can train them better. You can you put exercise in place. Um, you can create law that requires statutory duties for people that they all have to do it. In a market where everybody's competing, unless you have a minimum standard, they may drop those standards to get their prices down. So I think you can embed resilience. 
But, and the but is, it's not easy. And the, the, the reason it's not easy, it seems to me, is because the calculus by which you make that assessment, how much you will invest, is always sounds, well, we should invest everything. No, you won't. And you won't because you can't afford it. So you have to decide within the standard distribution of the threat, where are you going to draw your lines? Now, you can put it as two standard deviations, and that will give you a certain response. Um, but if you shift that line, <clears throat> and because every time you move it, it will cost you money and time and effort. Yep. And as I think, as we've just been saying, when the event that you are planning against is 20 years ago, your likelihood of investing today is limited until it's a real extant threat. And then we all stand up and say, right, let's invest in this too late. So I think, and the, and the final thing I'll just observe on this is that the way that business has developed, and this is not a criticism of business, just observation of fact, is that an awful lot of um, investment in just in time. So, you know, you need to, right. you don't need to keep a big stock. You're it's a warehouse, why would you? Buffer. But then suddenly you need 2,000 beds or you need 20,000 firearms or, or wherever it happens to be, they aren't there. Your lead time is quite long. So it's antagonistic to reserve capacity. Now, sometimes the reserve capacity goes over, over the top, but whether it be power generation, food supply, health response, I mean, a lot of our health, I think it's happened in America, I can't say, in, in other countries, but certainly in the UK, we've reduced our health specialists to limited places where you would get better care. If you have a stroke, you have an accident, a collision, you'll get excellent care, your survivability is good. But then if 200 patients turn up in, in one hour, does it cope, or does it cope over 365 days when you arrive at the rate of two a day? So those are the challenges for any system, I think, to embed resilience when all, everything in our system shouts, don't pay that money. Martin, how different does the challenge of assessing the threat and the, the practice of discussing the threat and coordinating the response look from Nairobi? Uh, well, the, thank you, Andrew. The, the single most um, important factor to answer all your questions, really, is effective government. Um, and effective government now increasingly presupposes more and more local decision making. And so Kenya in 2010 changed its constitution and devolved power down to the local level. That's the first um, basis of effective government, is the ability of government to be observed and, be li and listen and have citizens participate. So that's the first thing Kenya did. And then everything else, the other technical pieces that follow uh, rest on that basic foundation. But the threat when it comes to a terrorist attack, uh, it's important, I think, to, to say, and I think it's an obvious point, but it's always good to note it, that the terrorist attack itself, its damage to lives and property um, is probably far less than car accidents in any global city. The, the real threat of that attack is the rupture it causes in social, political, and cultural bonds. So preparedness is not necessarily just the technical piece of how many armed men do you have within the, breaking, the incident point, but rather what kind of early warning systems do you have about the promotion of hatred, of division, because where hatred is growing, eventually violence will follow. And so if your point of responsiveness and resilience is response at the point of violence, then that is not very effective. You must go much further and understand that. Now, that's very difficult for democratic societies because we have rights. We have um, rights of association. But at this point, uh, democracies and liberal societies have to fight for their values. And how that is done is what we need to debate a lot more. Right. Can I just uh, bring you in on Bernard's point about the just-in-time supply chains of, uh, of, of, of corporate America and, and uh, global business. Yeah, good luck um, with that one. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you, you, work, you have a lot of partnerships with the private sector, as right. you're saying. Um, have you seen that becoming a problem? We've seen exactly what you described happen, where it, it makes perfect business sense um, until there's a, a spike in demand. Like Ebola and personal protective gear, for example, why would you ever carry stuff that you're not going to sell? I think you want to reduce your carrying costs. You don't want to pay to have stuff made until you have a purchase order, right? Well, and then when a global epidemic erupts, it, it doesn't work. There's a two-year wait or something. So 
I think for all of the benefits um, that just-in-time provides, uh, efficiencies, it doesn't cover all the scenarios, including an unanticipated spike. So uh, what we try to do is, uh, I, I think as many of you have said, there are predictable things that can happen. So stockpiling in our world is a good thing. I think you don't want to stockpile everything, but you want to have enough stockpile so that you can respond predictably, like for hurricanes in the United States, you know they only happen during certain months, and yeah. they only happen in certain places, and after 10 years of responding, you have, can look at the data and see what, had it been available, would have averted people from going into the emergency room, which was not at all what people thought. Um, Katrina, Rita, I think a lot of the mass evacuations in the United States, there's such a high level of chronic disease, diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, and uh, in particular, and asthma actually, and those three conditions, if you have a mass evacuation and you don't have your inhaler, your insulin, or your hypertensive medication, that is literally who goes into the emergency rooms. It's not because they're aspirating water or they've been hit, and that's knowable. So that's why just this week we were pre-positioning in 58 sites around the likely evacuation routes for the primary uh, care health centers around the United States. We've been doing that ever since Hurricane Katrina because we saw that, but it was, and then we hold a bit of a stockpile. But I think for us working with um, businesses like AbbVie here who gets that and says, that doesn't work for anybody. How can we help you do what you need to do to preposition stuff, to have a stockpile for the known really bad problems that are preventable and they've been actually very generous and, and smart and thoughtful to unlock some of their strategic planning, their supply chain folks, um, how you manage cold chain. And that has been critically important for, for Direct Relief to be able to be both preemptive, uh, as you were saying, as well as responsive. Can I just give you just one quick yep. example, which was against us rather than, you know, I'm not criticizing other people. We in, in the UK, right, it may happen elsewhere, all the police stations would have very big uh, tanks to hold diesel or petrol. Right. And it was about 90 to 120 a day supply. Hmm. Do you think with the price of oil, how much value you got stuck in the ground? Now, sometimes that worked in your favor because the oil price you know, went up and that, that was fine. But they eventually somebody said, oh, this is ridiculous, we've got petrol stations. Well, that was fine until somebody had a petrol strike. And then what happened was all this, the, the, we were really, in some parts of the country were struggling to meet our own needs. But in the parts of the country, because we have 43 forces, where forces had continued to keep that supply, they became the supplies for the doctors, right. mm. the health workers, the other people right. who needed it, because the petrol stations failed, because the distribution chain fell. But it was entirely logical to do what had happened. There was nothing wrong with it. It wasn't the wrong decision. But without that type of resilience, and uh, sometimes the things we've learned over time, we, uh, the, the financial pressures do cause us to make logical but not necessarily helpful decisions at times. The FT would tell you there's a tremendous hedging opportunity there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> play with the oil lake. Um, um, but so, I think equally, I think we, we discovered it's true in every country. I think 90% of the, the petrol um, in possession is sat in the te petrol tanks right. of our vehicles, not being used. Very little relatively in the petrol stations, actually. But. In a disaster, <laughs> siphon off the yeah, yeah, uh, cop car. <laughs> and, um, and if I could just interject there, the, the point you made earlier about then designing, right, and bringing that back to the design of cities, mm. I, I think that's critically important. So as we see these connected infrastructures, um, your example, or we've looked at the reliance on the power grid, reliance on the natural gas system. And, you know, when you see what can happen when natural gas isn't available, for whatever reason, whatever sort of attack or disaster, um, and what that means for the power grid, and then the power grid, of course, is pumping the water and having transportation run. And so this ripple effect starts occurring. And so we've looked at what are those design strategies, uh, the resilience enhancements that we can put in place that really help um, to embed resilience within cities and regions. And things like microgrids, um, that's one strategy, but there's many others that people are really looking at. And then also all the way down to a micro level where our material scientists are looking at how can we think about the materials of infrastructure differently. Um, the woman on the panel prior was talking about too much concrete. Um, there are other materials and we need to keep advancing the science around materials so that we are more resilient 
um, when something bad does happen. I, th I think next year we may need a whole separate panel on drywall because this, yeah. is, a, yeah. <laughs> this is a running uh, theme that keeps coming up. Um, uh, I mean, do you think there is, you know, do we need to start establishing a, a hierarchy of infrastructure here? Because, you know, you talk about the power grid, but one of the things that struck me after London was just um, cell phone communications. Um, you know, obviously, you know, when you, when you talk about cyber attacks, uh, cyber risk, and even flooding risk, data centers, you know, how dependent we all are mm -hmm. on having instant access to our data, whether we're, you know, citizens or, or first responders. Um, uh, you know, how do you prioritize these? Um, I think you're uh, particularly on the communication side, which is extremely important. Your communications and logistics are the two big issues that you have to deal with. And it's, it's having a plan of having, how are you going to communicate? And not just having one thing. You know, are you going to communicate with your employees with telephone, uh, Twitter, uh, you know, uh, email, or whatever you're going to do, making phone calls? Or have, you have to have several things laid out. How are you going to communicate to the public? And you communicate to the public through the press. Uh, you know, you can stand up in the street and talk all you want to. If the press isn't there to distribute that information, nobody's going to hear it. So having that relationship with the, with the press is, is so important to set up that communications. And, uh, and I think that's the key is to have that plan in place ahead of time uh, and do the what if. What's the worst case scenario? You know, our total phone system is down. You know, how are you going to communicate to, to people, let them know what you want them to do? You want them to shelter in place? You want them to go to a shelter somewhere else or, or, or just don't do anything, <laughs> you know? And so, but if you don't have the plan in place ahead of time, and if you don't have a backup and a backup and a backup, uh, we saw in disasters around the world, you know, and I'll pick, pick here on the United States, several large disasters we've had, there was no communication plan in place. The public did not know what to do. Uh, there was no relationship with the press, uh, and uh, there was no relationship between the, uh, the states and the, and the federal government and the locals, so every, there was no situational awareness. You've got to have that plan in place, and it's got to have a backup and a backup and a backup, because that communication is the key. What yeah, I was going to, just to pick up, and then I think Facebook hosted a, its first meeting a week ago that Direct Relief was at for exactly, it used to be the press, you know, if you get it to the press, they would be the broadcaster. Well, now the social media channels are themselves broadcasters and have millions of people locked in. I mean, God forbid you lose your phone for a minute. <laughs> and I think we work with them to make sure that they, they initially started thinking that they wanted to enable peer-to-peer -peer communication for, you know, I'm safe, which is important. And then there were some thoughts about, oh, I need shoes or I lost my clothing. All the people who'd done this said, don't, don't do that. There are people who, that's, that's a bad idea. But what would be a good idea is to, um, I mean, typically activity is based on information. If it's bad information, you have a bad activity, like Bernard was saying for intelligence. Um, it's the same thing for emergencies. So I think because of the public information officers that you train who know how not to incite panic, how to give good information, we encouraged and Facebook invited them so that they could have a, basically an avenue to reach people in a, in a geographically targeted area, good, relevant, current information from an authority, which we thought was a good thing and we were happy to be, but it gives you an example of the pr involvement of the private businesses that hadn't really thought about that. Right. Um, yeah, just yesterday they launched their Facebook mapper that will show you the actual, the every 15 minutes, the flow of people based on their geotagged phones, they will know where they're going, kind of a Google Maps, you know, a traffic, you know, the red and green, they'll have that for actual physical location of people. It's, it was just profiled. So we think that is a real step forward, but trying to make sure there's an integration so it's not just going cowboy. It's like, this is cool, let's put this app out and we've got it figured out now to make sure that in emergencies in particular, there's a really strong, important role for the government leadership in centrality. And as frustrating as that may be, that's the way it is, and it's incumbent upon the government, I think, as Mark was saying, to earn that trust and keep it. And if you lose that, it's chaos. Okay, so let's focus on this question of leadership. Who, you know, we've, we've talked about the different stakeholders here. You know, many of you represent different um, levels at the national level, the, federal, the, the, the global city level, the county level, um, the university level, the, you know, um, the nonprofit sector level, uh, the corporate level I know is widely represented in the audience. Um, who should take the lead? Uh, and does that vary crisis, crisis by crisis and uh, threat by threat? I think it depends on how your city is set up 
do you have a strong mayor or do you have a strong city manager type? Uh, and whoever that person is, that's the lead person. The part of the problem we see though is generally a lot of times the lead person doesn't participate in the exercises and the planning. So they come in, I'm in charge, but they really don't understand what's happening and what they should be doing. Um, the, the second piece I see is oftentimes they're unwilling to make the tough calls. You know, uh, you know, when I was the emergency manager in, in Miami-Dade County, we would have to evacuate Miami Beach on occasion. And a lot of elderly people, uh, walkers and wheelchairs, and that's a tough call to make. And we had to do that even in a category one storm. So that, but you gotta make the call. And sometimes you do that, you evacuate a large population of people and the hurricane goes the other way. Yep. And then you get accused of being overreactive. But that's what you're there for. As a leader, you have to make that tough decision. We saw it in, in Katrina. You know, we saw a lack of will, a political will, to call for an evacuation in a timely manner. We ended up with 18,000 people in a Superdome who should not have been there. We ended up with 1,800 people killed, drowned in their, most of them drowned in their homes uh, because they did not have time to evacuate. Uh, there were no transportation uh, set up. There was no uh, shelter set up. There was no place for people to go. And we had a lot of major issues. Um, and I, I, you know, I use this. I've never seen a politician being sworn in and say, I solemnly swear to do my best to get reelected again. That's not what they're getting elected for. They're getting sworn in to take care of the people uh, that are their residents of their area. And uh, so that you've got to, if you're going to be in charge, you've got to be willing to make the tough decision. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, we, we just uh, saw it in London where there were good call was made, where they raised the level to the highest level, and they got some criticism for that. But that was the right thing to do, uh, and that was a good call. Um, you know, we've seen other times where uh, we've had uh, uh, mayors not make the right decision, and people, you know, we saw it in one big city where kids got stuck in their schools because the mayor did not call, did not close the schools, afraid it was going to be called as overreacting. So anybody so, think it shouldn't be with the mayor? Well, I, the, the thing, first of all, just support David in, in two big ways. One is that quite often, you, I'm afraid, you get people in elected positions. It, it's thrust upon them at times, but they, they haven't been trained for the role or exercise, so I can't criticize them for it. But I can criticize them if they've been offered that opportunity and ignore it. That's not acceptable for me. So I think it's a really, a really important point. The best of leaders that I've seen of politicians have based their evidence or their decisions on the facts, not on the politics of the situation. As soon as I hear them saying, how will this appear, I worry. <laughs> yeah. that, you know, that's not, it's not about how it appears, it's yeah. how it affects people and whether it's an effective route. So I think for me that's profound. Secondly, just to offer a quick example from the UK, I think one thing that has developed over time, partly because our history, not of natural disasters in the same way, it's not been something for our country that's been a, a big thing, but we have had the sort of the terrorist side more. We have got, I think, quite an effective way of both working with and corralling political control, which I think is good. It's called COBRA, which is the um, cabinet office briefing room which uh, the prime minister runs usually, or one of the ministers, sat with all the people in the room, like we might around this table. And who would be represented, just give people an example? Depends, depends on the, uh, if it's flooding, then the head of environment. Right. Uh, if it's terrorism, the home office. But usually the most senior minister will, will preside. Then you've got military, security service, police, whoever sat around the, uh, the room. Yes, you have press, and then you have video links into wherever the event uh, has happened. What I think it really helps that room work, the people sat in the room know what they know, mm. but that thing will be changing minute by minute, second by second. Or somebody in the meeting will say, well, are they red? Are there 200 of them? What's going to happen next? You may not know. But outside the room, in a penumbra, behind a screen, people are listening to that conversation to support you. And when somebody asks a question, that comes up a laptop, so we have an informed discussion uh, in real time. And the second thing I think which has helped stood us in good stead is something called the gold, silver, bronze. So, you know, you, you say, well, who should lead? And our answer is, well, it depends on who's the better for each of those positions. So the gold is the strategic, uh, the, the bronze is the tactical, those people on the ground, and the, the other one, the silver, is the one in between, trying to make this strategy uh, enabled for the tactical. That model is flexible. It doesn't matter about seniority, um, and it may change over the time of the event, but everybody's very clear. And the only final thing I'll mention very quickly, I always think, because we, you know, we are sat talking about how you plan resilience, and the plan always sounds great until you meet the enemy. And then the problem's different. So what it, for me is vitally important is the people who first turn up have got to be well-trained, well-led, well-equipped, and they've got some flexibility. 
for at least, I don't know, it varies by disaster, mm. but three, four, six hours until the whole act gets its act together. These people underground are going to be your eyes and ears. And I wouldn't exclude the public from this. I think that's where the internet is a real enabler because people find their own solutions. And in the past, you know, the state can't provide it all. And sometimes they need emergencies. If it's unexpected, people can find their own. Eventually the systems kick in. But that first period, if it's not the hurricane that you expect, you, for me, you've got to have flexibility there to get good people the opportunity to succeed. Then the whole system starts to kick in. Does it look very different? Um, well, two, two quick sayings, um, very wise ones. Uh, Mike Tyson, I think, once said, everyone has a plan until I hit them on the mouth. <laughs> uh, so, you know, how you, how you respond to the yeah. breakdown of your plan is uh, clear, clearly very, very key. The other saying is um, terrorism is mass murder with a media strategy. So there's nothing quite like responding to a terrorist incident uh, in this sort of fishbowl where every action by the security services and responders is under a magnifying glass. I think it's never been this intense before. And so obviously any operation will not be perfect and there will be some issues there. Um, I think I've seen some really positive changes. You don't want to suppress the press freedom through law. Um, but we've seen some really great developments in places such as France, where the media said we will no longer identify these attackers by name. I think part of aiding response to terrorist attacks um, is having the media be very aware that the person planning on the attack is thinking precisely how to play you and is thinking how to make hay off the way the Financial Times reacts. Um, and that's their message. If, in fact, if they had no coverage at all, they'd probably not do it. Um, so it's an, obviously there's a responsibility to report, but I think the media is going to play an increasingly important role in how it polices itself um, around these sorts of terrorist incidents. I want to come back to you briefly um, on this, uh, Bernard, because you know, one of the um, uh, we've had a lot of practice, but uh, you know, regrettably in most newsrooms at dealing with uh, terrorist attacks. Um, and uh, every time one happens, somebody starts sharing around Twitter a sort of 10 point uh, guide to what to remember in the event of these things. And it uh, starts with um, the early information is often wrong, especially the information shared on social media uh, in the confusion of an attack. Um, I think the second point is, you know, listen to official sources. And in the case of London, you know, the main official source was the, the Metropolitan Police Twitter feed. Um, what t were you doing in your time uh, as commissioner to think about that communication strategy to the media and to the public? Well, there are two things. Really. We, we had the problem in, I took over in 2011, and people may remember, but there were riots in London. 26 of the 32 boroughs experienced riots. It was a terrible time. It was over three days. A couple of people were murdered and fires you know, in, in major parts of the city. One of the things we realized was that one, the attackers were organizing themselves through Twitter, and we weren't. And we weren't even able to monitor and understand uh, in real time what was happening. So that was a big thing. We created something called the All Sorts Hub, uh, which means basically you have people monitoring this stuff, and you get clever software that will try and um, bring to your attention in this mass of stuff what's relevant. Um, and that was something that was embedded and has been successful. And then number two is we had to gear up people who could use this medium in a clear, succinct way. Um, we, as the state, often have a big problem because we don't want to share information until we're sure. Because otherwise, journalists, you'll not understand this, Andrew, but journalists can pick you up afterwards. Well, you said that, and it's wrong. So which do you want? Do you want it new, clear, fresh, or do you want it right? And I'm afraid one's antagonistic to the other. So that's but a real record. We want it right. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's a challenge. It's everybody, of course, we all want information. But it, this, the state and you know the uh, the establishment, if you like, always want to try and make sure it's right and then tell you and not be criticised afterwards for getting it wrong. Sure. So it's a natural, it's a natural thing that we always are on that t that tension. Uh, on just just quickly on the point about you know the um, point about trying to work with the media though in a very positive way. One of the things after the Charlie Hebdo attack. When I, as we, all, we, we might have all seen, what well, really worried me, there was a part after the, the, the attackers had gone to ground, they eventually were discovered in a factory. And we saw live, uh, the, I don't know if the French police or the military going through the roof of the factory. 
Now you bear in mind, if you're one of those soldiers going through that roof, you've got one thing in your favor, which is called surprise. And the people inside could have been looking at you, waiting for you to come down that rope or whatever. And that really worried me. So we got the BBC, we got you know, the, the international press together. So we can't ask you not to report, but we would like a delay right. on the grounds that we've just explained. We had a, you know, we got them in, it wasn't like, I'm telling you to do it. We had debate. We talked, we shared the problem, said, is there anything else here you can do? So that agreement is now in place. Now it's not, it's not universal. You could never say that's a piece of law, they won't do it. There may be some circumstances that none of us can anticipate, but the abounding honor to at least consider that, that, that problem that we'd identified um, because we, probably those in, in the UK can remember back in the, the Iranian embassy many years ago, the SAS went in and the act of surprise saved lots of people's lives. Mm. Um, surprise is one of your major mm. attributes and the media in live reporting don't help with that. That requires a measure of trust between yeah, the different and that's where you need to talk. Yeah, Andrew, I just wanted to bring together the, the two conversations around leaders and information. Yeah. Um, your question about who should lead, I'm not gonna take the bait and try to answer that one. Um, but I do want to highlight that I do think the, the public has an expectation that their leaders will use the best available data and facts to make the best informed decisions. And that's where the science and engineering, we've got to keep pushing that. We've got to keep pushing the R&D. And that information has got to get in the hands of those decision makers so that they can make the timely, most informed decision given the tragedy of the situation they're in. So actually, I have a question from the audience I want to just pull forward from Christina Warner. You know, how can predictive analytics, machine learning, and AI help cities manage global threats? I, mean, I think the, the sort of broader framing of that is how, how is sort of new data, how is the data changing and our ability to interpret the, the data changing to manage these threats? What are you seeing? Yeah, it's, uh, the data is coming fast and in volumes that we've never seen before. That's requiring computing resources at a higher level. Um, for instance, our supercomputer at Argonne is going to get an upgrade so that uh, the computation can run uh, even faster so your personal computer can do a computation in 20 years that it takes right now our supercomputer a day to do and we're going to get that down to an hour. Mm -hmm. And you have to have that computing power to really understand what's happening with the data and to do the machine learning. Um, but I think that that is a real uh, interesting area that we are exploring as well as many others on how can we bring those capabilities to the decision makers like the gentleman that I'm sitting around the table with um, when you're in a pre-event and to predict what might happen, but also during an event in real time to be able to see what, mm. what's transpiring. What, what data are you using? You talked about just the basics of, you know when hurricane season starts. Um, right. Are you are you playing with much more granular? Yeah, I think there's, a, in, in the US, I think there's a lot of public data. So we basically synthesize the public data from from the CDC to the state level reporting to the, you know, you, you actually have pretty good epidemiological reports. We have live feeds from NOAA coming in. You can see the inundation zones in a level four hurricane. You know exactly how far the water would push in, which power grids would be at risk. So I think it, it's basically, we do a lot of um, put it all and maps are great because you can kind of synthesize and visualize them spatially on a map. So I think um, that has been a really helpful way to kind of bring all this aggregate the data on a map so it tells a story much more so than just a bunch of, you know, lists and narr narration uh, narratives do. So, um, yeah, I think that's, and internationally, I think the public health reporting is a little bit spotty. I think the intelligence services have a unique, secure channel for their own thing, but for a very good reason. I think, you know, it's, it's all based on trying to get the best information on which you can form the best judgment and take the best action. I think I would just agree with everything you said. I think that the, um, the real challenge, and I think why mayors are essential, is because they're close to the action. I mean, they have to fix potholes. They know, they know the leadership in, in neighborhoods. Like, call that guy or, or that woman. Everyone will listen to them. That, that's critically important. We see that even in an emergency, people key off of who they know. Um, sometimes if it's uh, a trusted, London Constabulary, they've earned that over the years and they will do it because the trust is earned. But, but otherwise, you've got to, I think mayors are inherently closest to the action. And like David and 
Bernard, they're also operational actors. Mm -hmm. I mean, cops and firefighters are the two people who do it every day. So they always stand out in these emergencies because it's not uh, the first time they've done it. They are practicing literally every day, whereas a public health officer who doesn't have operational control and is put in operational control on the worst day ever, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> so I think mayors and Agreed. the people who uh, are on it every time, I think you, they naturally emerge. They're usually um, quite impressive and you have to key off of them if you're coming with external resources like Direct Relief does. But they've got to be able to listen to the people who do it every day, to the emergency managers, the police chiefs, fire chiefs, um, and the, the because like we said earlier, oftentimes they're not participating in the exercises. Mm, right. So you put the right people around them and then they're willing to make the tough call when they have to. Uh, then I think that makes them very successful. If they don't listen uh, and just try to do it because of what they think, uh, then they're going to have problems. I, I think there's a fairly clear message emerging, emerging for the mayors in the audience. Show up for the drill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Martin, how's the quality of data that you're now working with as you assess the terrorist threat? Um, well, it's increased, uh, but we are not yet uh, a big data society in the sense of using uh, big data throughout the decision-making uh, process. Uh, so that's something we have to get to. The opportunities, of course, are that Kenya um, has a huge mobile phone penetration um, and a huge um, uh, mobile money uh, penetration as well. Uh, so you can use these pieces of data to do a lot of research on where people live, their movements, uh, and the different pieces that you need for response time. What is needed now, in fact, just that mention of the supercomputer really uh, brought me up short. 20 years for one hour. Uh, I'll never think of my laptop the same, <laughs> same way. But it, it seems to me that we need to take opportunities uh, like the work that's being done on data analytics here uh, and pair it up with some of our response systems in Kenya uh, because there's a lot you're learning um, and there's a lot of capability there. And so I really welcome uh, these kinds of collaboration because ultimately we have less resources to work with. Everyone has limited resources, but ours are significantly limited. Um, and the cities have not been traditionally well planned. Um, and so being able to bring some data analytics, even at the most basic level, is very important. And lastly, I wanted to say one of the very um, um, exciting sort of developments is this ability to bring different stakeholders around a table to think of emergency response uh, and resilience. And so in Kenya, uh, around the issues of public safety and terrorism, uh, we have started opening forums that bring together citizens, security services, uh, um, respected personalities within the community. And they're able to sit down and discuss what are the issues right at the local level that are affecting us. Um, and I What sort of issues are they discussing at those? Those could be issues about um, where does there seem to be recruitment going on? Where is there incitement? And a lot of times citizens are ahead of the security services because they understand who these people right. are. Uh, and so the ability to create these forums in itself is not sufficient for the emergency response, mm. um, but it helps a great deal. And I think that's one of the promising areas that, that we've seen movement in. And the amount of data coming from citizens to the security services in Kenya has quantitatively leaped because of this kind of approach. So I've got... Uh, Two questions on citizens, and I'll, uh, um, uh, there's no good sequencing of them. But so, for, first off, um, you know, we talk about uh, all of us obsessively on our mobile phones, following every tweet in a, in, after a disaster. But that is that may capture a slice of us in this room. Uh, the digital divide is real uh, in all of our communities. You know, is there a concern that? Um, in our focus on the, 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 the technological solution to this, we are actually going to be leaving uh, behind um, some people and neglecting some people on the wrong side of that divide. 
I suppose you have to do both, really, don't you? <clears throat> Sometimes when we talk about these, I felt it a little over the last two days, the tendency to say cities or it's nation states when yeah. it's probably going to be both, and it's just where you, how you enable that balance to be, be appropriate. But I think it's true here. I mean, people sometimes feel that the population is divided by age by their ability to use the digital, the digital uh, opportunities. But I'm not entirely convinced by that, because it seems to me that people who you might think by age are less likely are more enabled because they need it. You know, they can't get to places. They need something to come to them. So it seems to me that that will naturally get better. And of course, as the kids are going through school, then clearly that's that's working. What I think you can't substitute, and this is as Marty was saying, one of the things we found is that about a third of the intelligence which leads to terrorist suspects being identified before the event tends to come from the public. Right. Because all the algorithms in the world don't spot unusual behaviour. They do spot other things, but. You know, if someone knows someone, the fact that somebody comes quiet or aggressive is a change. You notice that. They become withdrawn or they change their behavior in some way, how they dress or where it happens to be. Sometimes it can be the only indicator. Sometimes it's wrong. But you'd be foolish to cut yourself off from it. So I would always say, and you'd expect you know, a cop to say this, you have to have a neighborhood-based policing system so that you know the people. You don't end up, as some countries in Europe would admit, there are some parts of their, their cities they don't patrol. And they only go in if it's very, very difficult. They go in groups of 20, and then they leave. There is no relationship. If you don't have a relationship, people won't trust you. They won't talk. And people aren't going to walk up on the street and just say, I know about this guy's really worrying me. They have to, it seems to me, they have to have a trust. That only comes from a relationship. So for me, having that, it doesn't have, have to be, only be the police. There are other s social actors who can help with that. But I think without that sort of network, the people contact is vital. Uh, but never easy in the biggest of our cities, where in our case in London, 8.6 million people, 32,000 cops working 24 hours. Uh, as a matter of personal curiosity. Sorry, Andrew. Yeah. The, the image of a counterterrorism operation is men in baklavas, the sophisticated uh, weapons. Mm. Um, as much as you invest in that, um, governments must now, either at the city level or at the national level, must invest a great deal in disengaging rehabilitating and reintegrating people. If you don't have these two wings uh, of your response, uh, odds are that sooner or later you're going to be overwhelmed, not necessarily militarily, but politically and socially. Um, it sounds as though we, we all agree on this panel that the citizen has a huge role to play in tackling any of these threats that we've discussed. Um, my question is how do you improve citizen engagement, uh, the citizen's engagement in these uh, in these threats you know, without freaking everybody out. Um, you know, you, if you shared every, every single thre threat you knew about as commissioner, um, you know, if you shared every sort of weather threat you knew about at, at FEMA, uh, the beaches would be empty and um, we'd all be living, uh, living in caves. But um, uh, how, how do you strike that balance and how, what's, what's been practically useful at drawing out uh, that kind of information from the public and that kind of preparedness work on the individual citizen level? I think for the natural disasters, that is very easy uh, because you're not scaring people. You're not, you know, you're, because they know what they have to prepare <clears throat> for. You just have to tell them how to do that. Uh, I think the, on the terrorism issue uh, or even for the, on the biological side, a type of a terrorism or uh, that, that, that's a tough, tough line that you don't want to cross. People need to be aware um, that there are threats out there, but you don't want them to think it's going to happen today. <laughs> you know, so you don't pre a panic issue. So that's a, it's a tough call. You know, I know with, uh, when we have issues with down in, in, uh, in Miami with this, uh, the Zika virus, uh, you know, we, uh, we were, had to be very careful about, yes, that's out there, and, uh, and it's very dangerous, particularly if you're pregnant or expecting to be pregnant, uh, it could have a, a devastating effect on your child. Uh, but instead of scaring them, we say, here's what you do to protect yourself. Mm. You know, you may want to stay out of this area. If you go outside, make sure you have, you know, bug spray on, all those types of things, or long sleeves. Uh, you know, so instead of saying, uh, you know, the world's coming to an end, we say, yes, here's this issue out there, and here's what you need to do to make sure that you... Public and your, information. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, but to lay it out in a way of how do you protect yourself, not just say, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's bad and run away. I mean, there's one very big tension that when you're talking to the public, you're talking to your potential enemy as well. Yeah. So if you lay out the, their potential effectiveness and your ability to detect, 
then you're explaining to them how to avoid it. Um, you know, you can look at air travel. And you, in, this, in this country, 9-11 was a massive impact on, I think, right across the world. And millions of us travel every day by air. So can you detect absolutely everything that's a danger? And which ones can't you? Is it 99% or is it 26%? Mm -hmm. And how could you avoid that detection? You know, and everybody says, right, then we'll stop flying. Well, that's, you know, so you, I suppose at some point, I hope the public would have to trust those who are best informed, best motivated to try and enable us all to carry on with a good life. Um, and if the risk ever gets so high or the threat ever gets so high that you, you, you yourself would be worried or your children were going to get hurt or your parents, then that's not a bad test for whether or not this thing should carry on the same way and should right. you then start to warn people. Um, but it's not, it's not easy because you can't come over as parental and the government coming over as parental is, is not necessarily a good thing. You want to share, I think you should share as much information as possible. But if your enemy is listening, you've got to be, you've got to be aware of that. Yeah. You know, citizens, uh, to come back to your issue about citizenship and its role, um, citizens are not born. You're not born a citizen. You're made a citizen. And that's not necessarily, you know, sort of the outgrowth of a totalitarian system where it's policed into you. Um, but I think there is an enormous corrosion of the concept and feeling of citizenship. I think I've seen it. Um, We've seen it in Kenya, certainly, because of identity-based politics, uh, whether they're racial, whether they're ethnic, or they're religious. Um, and this identity politics, even if it's response to unfairness um, through identity, uh, corrodes citizenship, it corrodes social cohesion, uh, and ultimately, it corrodes the very basis of living together in a city. And it makes you more vulnerable uh, to terrorists and extremists uh, because when they attack you, they aim for those cracks. So I think one of the things that I hope could emerge from this fantastic conversation in Chicago uh, is the need to go back to uh, citizenship development, citizenship protection and advocacy, uh, and a reduction in the identity-based politics that really globally seem to be growing by the day. So we're, we're, we're coming to uh, the last five minutes of our, of our panel here, and I want to get in another question from the audience. Um, Cecile Shea via Twitter says, asks, how do we balance preparing for the most dangerous scenarios versus the most likely scenarios? How do you weigh the, the black swan that could be truly terrible versus the thing that's going to hit you every, every hurricane season? You know, I, the, what we tell cities uh, is you plan for the worst. It, uh, it, uh, I'll give you an example. If, uh, if an earthquake takes a building down or a terrorist blows it up, the response is the same. Now, the building comes down differently. You have more uh, voids in a, in survivability in a earthquake and survivability in an earthquake than you would in a bomb. But, that, but, it, uh, but the truth is the response is exactly the same. So whether you're preparing for an earthquake or a terrorist bomb or wildfire, uh, your management of a disaster is, is the same. Uh, you now you may have a different uh, uh, agency handling it. It would be different if it was a, a terrorist event. You'd have the law enforcement be more in charge of some of the decision making, but the response for, for EMS, for fire, is exactly the same, uh, you know, working with a different agency. So I, I, don't, I don't see a difference, quite honestly, in preparing for what you know you're going to have and preparing for what could be the worst. Could you plan for the worst? and then everything else kind of falls in place. Yeah, I, I think we have something written at work. It just says, do the thing that you know you're going to do under any scenario. For us, it's cold chain capacity. It doesn't matter if it's um, you know, a, a, a disease no one had heard of, or if it's a mass evacuation or if a mass um, vaccination program. If you don't have a significant amount of cold chain capacity, you're not going to do any of them. So it's not to your point. So you can with confidence, you know, both the probable and the, the uh, kind of catastrophic but unlikely, many of the things you're going to do are going to be the same. If it's nuclear war versus global warming, I don't know. I That's think why the, you have the Pacific or the Chicago Council. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. No, go. Thank you. Uh, we, we think similarly at Argonne. Uh, we basically look at, it's less about the infliction, like what's causing the incident to start, and it's more about what's happening as a result 
-hmm. and how do we change things so that we're more resilient? Um, and I think that's a critical component of this. It's, you know, if it's a terrorist trying to do a cyber attack on a substation, or that substation goes out because of the polar vortex, it, you know, to us it's the substation is out, what's happening, and how do we really build the resilience around that? I think the other thing I would add is that it seems to me that if you're planning for the general, you embed that in your training and your general systems. So you, when you recruit a corp or a firefighter or whatever, the, the normal span of things you embed in their training and in the leadership and, and in the systems you put in place, the exercises that we run are for the incredible, uh, the things that might never happen or sometimes, please God, they ne you know, we hope they never happen. So the exercise and all the contingency plans around that exceptional event when not only one person will deal with it, but you put all together 100 people. You spend 20 million pounds. You, the, the whole health service comes under a huge, um, huge pressure. It's when the, the abnormal happens that you, it seems to me, that you, you exercise for. Okay, we've spent an hour looking at the abnormal and, the, uh, and scaring ourselves silly, so let's end on something a little constructive and uplifting. There's a question from the audience. Can you provide an example of the most promising solutions to some of these problems? What have you seen that is actually working? And we'll keep it short and, short and tight. Anything we've not mentioned yet, the way you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on, give us oh, I, I, can I, I think <laughs> we've been delighted to see that uh, the, the interest and engagement, investment, and participation of private companies in things that were traditionally the purview of public sector actors, and it's from emergencies, it's from public health outbreaks, it's from planning, it's really, it's clear. They're running complex organizations. They have great tools, great people, tons of resources, and they live in the same communities. So the more they're invited and we figure out a way to work with these people who happen to be in the private sector, uh, the better it's going to get, I believe. I, th I think we've, we've probably talked about one or two on the way, but one just very practical one is because we realize that when you're having any major incident, one of the things people can now do is to share with you live footage or alternatively retrospective footage of what it is you're dealing with. And sometimes that comes up through the mass media, but you know, it's not too controlled. So now on the Metropolitan Police website, you can live download you know, stuff that we can quickly look at. It's still quite a volume issue, but it's better to have it and have that problem yeah. than not have access to it. Best that'll be in the Cobra briefing room. Yeah. I think the biggest thing we've realized that is uplifting is today we know that you can become rich in a generation. For the first time in, in human history, you can take an entire city, an entire country, and if you have the right policies, you can go from being poor to being wealthy. We've seen it happen in country after country. And ultimately, the resilience, the resources, uh, the planning comes, that doesn't come, it doesn't come first, then you get rich. Actually, usually you get rich and then it comes. Um, and so because we know this, uh, we're in a position to say we can make Nairobi a wealthy city uh, that does not let any of its citizens down. Now I'm feeling better. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you to, to our panel for ending on that high note um, and to all of you for your questions. Uh, we are going to continue the discussion at the workshop this afternoon, but um, uh, I think it's established the sheer uh, importance of this subject and just how much global cities can uh, have to learn from each other on this. So thank you very much. Thank you.